Hi, welcome to a new video on actual, actual spinster. So today I'm going to go through, I think quite briefly, a list of books that I would consider like lesbo-erotic early to mid-century literature, as in 20th century. Some of them I've definitely spoken about before, which is also kind of why I wanted to do this fairly briefly so it's not boring, but I actually would really like to maybe make more videos like this, so I just thought I would do like a first batch so we can like cover my bases. And that way if I make a video in the future, like, because I mean, lesbo-erotic fiction is kind of what I read, or at least what I like to read, so that I don't have to wait like three years and then make a video with like 25,000 titles, I thought I would just go with what I got have. This isn't in any particular order, but I think I'll just start with the books that like I don't have physical copies of. And as I'm doing this, like I would love to hear your opinions on like, or your thoughts about these books books and or if you think there are like other lesbo-erotic books that fit from that like so that were published between 1900 and 1950 that you would include. I think also maybe it will become clear some of what I mean by like lesbo-erotic. These books all don't have like lesbian romances or anything like that. Like it could be that but it could also be like a vibe or like the intensity of, of connection between women in the book or I don't know like some things are just lesbo-erotic you know. So one of the books that I don't have is Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner. Because it isn't a romance book maybe people will find that confusing but I personally just found it to be like a book that was very much about coming to love yourself in a way that is like very queer. Some of what literally happens in the story it felt to me like a way of metaphorically demonstrating like coming to love yourself and your queer self. Another book I don't have with me is Despised and Rejected by Rose Alatini. I think it's a pretty remarkable book. It's It was published in 1918 and it's about gay pacifists and their bisexual women friends. Well at least that's how I would define it. <laughs> So it mostly follows two protagonists, Antoinette something and is he called Robert? It's a while since I read it and Antoinette like is, I think it's very clear that she's pretty bisexual but like at the beginning of the book especially there's some like very intense lesbo-erotic intensity but without any shame which is also what was like really delicious about reading the book and also what was like so like charming but also like shocking. Uh, an experience that I found. And the other book that I don't have with me, and I guess what this will like start the discussion about uh, Virginia Woolf books, but that's Orlando by Virginia Woolf, which is like very, it's like a classic piece of like lesbo-erotic sapphic fiction. It's a, a book that is a biography of this character called Orlando who changes gender throughout the story. He starts as a man, well a boy I guess, and then suddenly he turns into a woman and then she goes galumphing around history and it's a it's also sort of a biography of Vita Sackville West who was in a relationship with Virginia Woolf at the time and so and there were also like pictures of her in the original book and yeah maybe I'll put some here so you can see how Lesbo wrote it, especially her hands. <laughs> the other Virginia Woolf books that I would include on this list include The Waves, Mrs Dalloway and To the Lighthouse. Of the three of these I think this one has the most like explicit lesbo eroticism. These two are definitely engaged in the relationships between women that are like definitely erotic in some ways and not in others. I do really need to reread this because I can't quite remember the names of the characters and stuff but there's definitely like a relationship in here that is sapphic. And then this one I think it's less about a specific kind of couple or pairing or whatever and more about like the way that like women look at other women and there's a specific character and how she looks at like this other woman character and stuff so anyway in terms of mrs dalloway i actually think this book is one of those books that like people kind of forget oh shit well of loneliness is also on this list i don't have it but like obviously but, but it's not a very good book <laughs> Yeah, but like what I was saying was I feel like people often forget how gay this is slash like they just don't even kind of mention it or think about this as a queer book but there's like very like explicit scenes where Clarissa, who's the main character, Mrs Dalloway, is thinking about Sally Seaton, a friend of her past and these moments that she shared with her and how they like lit her on fire and made her feel aflame and yeah and like kissed her on the lips in the garden and plucked flowers like it's very lesbian. Okay this book How's End by Ian Forster. I'm not gonna say who I think it is because it's actually a spoiler but like I would include this on like a kind of continuum of lesbian eroticism because one of the main characters Meg has like a particular relationship with another character and I think that's really gay and I think Meg does some of the stuff she does in the book. Try not to spoil it because she's invested in this other woman character in a way that like she can't quite understand. I don't know it's like nebulous and a bit confusing but like 
if you've read the book, like, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> this I've also spoken about very recently, quite a lot, Passing by Nella Larson, which obviously should just be on the list because it's very queer. This book, The Re Return of the Soldier by Rebecca West, is like a very like, like the main character, I think I call, she's called Jenny, is just like latently bisexual and so obviously drawn towards like both the soldier that returned from the war, which is what this book is about, and also the woman that he's lo he loves. She's like a, a classic kind of bisexual love triangle, except from like they can actually fill out the triangle because two of them are attracted to each other and then she's attracted to both of them, or at least that's my onion. Yeah, it's a very short book and it's very well written. It's also very classist, but it's definitely interesting. And this was also published in 1918. I think like in terms of intensity, it actually has like fairly similar vibes to Mrs. Dalloway. A book that has to be on this list, however, is an unbearable book. And it's definitely like an anti-recommendation recommendation if you want to read lesbo erotic early to mid century fiction. And that's Nightwood by Juna Barnes. This is quite like fragmented novel. It does have like characters weaving in and out. It isn't a short story collection, but it is written in these quite like chunk sections and it's set in the Roaring Twenties in Paris mostly and it documents the lives of Americans and Europeans and it also is set like kind of in a circus. Yeah anyway it's, it's, it's a book that will make you feel sick and is also like so articulate in ways it's kind of disgusting and then also it's also a very problematic book but then it's also like kind of an amazing thing to read. I wish I could give Juno a hug like I'd say then the last three books I have to show you are also quite like difficult books so there's this Women Lovers or The Third Woman by Natalie Clifford Barney translated by Chelsea Ray and this was originally written in French Natalie Clifford Barney it was one of the like expatriate Americans living in France in the 1900s and this was written in 1926 but not published until 2013 and then this translation is from 2016 so like a very long time <laughs> the reason it looks like this is because I wrote like my dissertation for undergrad partially on it and it tells the story of like a love affair between one woman, her lover, and then this third woman who comes in and starts disrupting things and it's very queer and like kind of monstrous and deeply lesbo-erotic. I haven't reread it in a while and it's, there's also something quite like uncomfortable and unsettling and violent about the way that it depicts these relationships. They're very intense and uncomfortable and they're also quite quite sexy and like they just like mesh and fold and bend and they do also break. So then there's this, which is Disavowals by Claude Caron. Oh, at least both were translated. Yeah, yeah, this is translated from the French by Susan de Muth, and the original French title is Avenue or Avenue. And they don't credit Marcel Moore on the cover, but I think that she should be credited too alongside Claude Caron because they were like an inseparable creative couple, basically. But anyway, so this book is quite like, like very experimental. I'm not sure if I could tell you what it means. It's quite like poetic. It's, it's almost more poetry than a novel, but it does also have collages and pictures and stuff, mostly collages, that were, I think, were created by Moore alongside the text, so it's quite like a fun, playful experiment with words and images and how you can make bodies with them or without them. It's a book that, like, now I've been talking about it more, I kind of would like to reread. I've got lots of, like, <laughs> writing in it from my past read. This was another one that I, like, wrote stuff about for my dissertation, so that's also why. I think if you're interested more about Claude Caron and Marcel Moore, then you should read Terza True Latimer. She's one of the academics that I remember being like the most cool about their relationship and how it was clearly very intertwined and reciprocal. Anyway, and then the last book is My Antonia by Willa Cather. This is a book I studied and I have a lot of like conflicting feelings about it, but I thought I would include it in this list as an example of like lesbo erotics because I think there's a lot of, uh, especially in the time period of these books that I'm talking about, there's this very like specific lesbian kind of deferral or like mirroring or like shifting or indirectness but like more than that like there's like a refraction of desire through things or different people or objects. It's why like objects and like symbols become so important in these texts because they hold space for meanings that are queer and that are like <laughs> I don't know, yeah, like lesbian, I guess, or like sapphic. And that's very interesting. It's also kind of sometimes quite hard to grapple with, both in terms of just like understanding and also feeling like you're const you're desperately trying to connect with these characters. You're desperately trying to like hold them in a same space, hold them within your own history or with your own understanding of history and like queer history. But it's also quite hard to do that because there's all of these like deferrals and like separations. And this book is a very frustrating book in that respect. So like, I guess one thing I want to say 
very clearly is like I think that the racial politics of this novel are pretty bad and it's not to say that there's as far as I remember like it was not that much actual representation of people of colour but what is bad is the way that this is set in the it was written in like 1918 it's set in like the 1890s in America and it represents like America as this like empty land where these like immigrants have come to settle on it and that's obviously not true and especially I think this is maybe Nebraska and especially in Nebraska or like specific I remember looking up about Nebraska specifically there were multiple different indigenous like nations living there and you know working with the land and existing and this book represents a particular kind of like really violent emptiness in the landscape that I think is part of like a really disgusting white supremacist understanding of who owns land and is like allowed to exist on it and so that's happening in this book and then at the same time the framing of this book is where like the queerness I think is most clear or is most unclear perhaps because it's told through well now I can't quite remember but like I'm pretty sure it's told by Jim Burden who is absolutely a fucking burden telling the story of his interactions with and like experience of Antonia but then Jim Burden is actually telling somebody about that story and so we but we never really find out who is who is speaking the story but we know that the narrator also has experiences with my Antony like they both know her but we never get like any particular insight or clues into that except from like the very opening that's where like it's all set up so within that like interplay there's this very specific I think like queering going on that means that like the desire that Jim Burden feels about Antonia is a desire that is like reciprocated by the eyes of the like woman like author or like narrator I mean I think Willa Cather had like a complicated relationship with gender but like I just think there's something very less erotic about like the gaze of this book on my Antonia and the way that it's trying to like displace itself via Jim Burden who's just like a really boring straight boy <laughs> there's quite a lot of like queer theory written about this book there was something else I wanted to say about it Jim Burden oh one thing I really love about it is this like particular kind of dedication to like againstness. We're like told explicitly in the first page how to pronounce Antonia's name as in not like Antonia but Antonia and it's because it's a an anti it's a, because it's like a very direct like I can't think of the right word but anyway so there's a lot to think about with this book it's, it's a very complicated book I guess one of the other reasons I wanted to like mention this is because like within a lot of books that do represent these like potentially lesbo erotic encounters or moments or symbols or whatever there can be like really like deeply uncomfortable like racial or racialized elements and there's very specific types of queerness that is like championed and lauded or written about in ways that like dissociate them from a lot of their actual politics that were also happening whilst they were being queer and like gender non-conforming. Yeah, there hasn't been very much scholarship on it but like, you know, lesbian fascists are a thing and, you know, especially kind of from the eras of the books that I was speaking about. Let's pretend nothing has changed. My camera died. So, but what I was saying in the before clip made me realise that there was this other book that I could talk about that also has like really bad representation of race, but I have also spoken about it before. But anyway, then I realised that I've forgotten two other books that I wanted to put on this list as well. So, but that was The Woman of the Wolf and Other Stories by Rene Vivian, which is from like 1904, and it's like a collection of short stories. And there is some like fun like gender fuckery in here, but like, but there is also just like a lot of racism that makes for pretty uncomfortable reading, especially because I feel like some of that racism is like bound up in how it represents like. Like gender non-conformity. Another Virginia Woolf book that I actually forgot to talk about is this which looks like a really large book but this is Night and Day and it's about Catherine Hilbury and Mary Datchett who are these two women it's set in like the Edwardian era and Mary Datchett specifically is like involved in like the suffrage stuff it's sort of like very early on so she's not it hasn't really like um, escalated into kind of like WSBU struggle where things are being like really disruptive but it's like at the beginning of this kind of like coming to consciousness about it I guess and yes yeah, so it's about these two women and I think it's pretty gay. I guess the other thing I wanted to say as well is like I definitely feel like for me there's like a, a big crossover between like sort of sapphic lesbian queer sexuality and this idea of like spinsterhood and like being alone and like unavailable to men specifically and so I feel like that's also partially where I'm like coming from with this like so I often kind of feel like a lot of like stories about women who choose to be alone or who like refuse marriage proposals or whatever are often quite like lesbian in how they in, in how they exist that's obviously just like my 
interpretation and feelings about it and I would say like some of this I feel like comes across in this novel. It's very much like a normal novel in comparison with VW's other works like that don't go <laughs> into this expecting like a modernist experimental thing. And there's also some definitely like crossovers and like interesting representations around like biography and I feel like Wolf's family as well like you can kind of see that she's writing writing some of her experiences into the characters. I think I'm pretty sure I think Mary Datchett is a sexy tourist so so there's that one. <laughs> then the one that I like I'm very sad about having forgotten is another Juno Barnes and this is Lady's Almanac and this is more than any of them I think like the quintessential piece of like lesbian lesbo-erotic fiction. It's like a parody of the community of like expatriate queers in Paris in the 1920s. It's written as like a fake almanac in a very kind of like circuitous style but it's a lot of fun. It's very like punny and just like kind of a bit freakish and very enjoyable and a bit sexy. So those were the three that I forgot and also the rest of them. I hope you enjoyed this video and it was interesting. I look forward to reading more lesbo-erotic fiction and living a lesbo-erotic life. I really hope I don't get like really homophobic, misogynistic comments on, on this video. Who knows? Anyway, <laughs> I hope you have a lovely day and I will talk to you when I talk to you. Bye!